Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live today. It's Saturday, November 10th, 2012. Our topic today, and I'll get the opening slide open. So you know what? People forgive me. I need to do this repeat so the recording will actually capture the right picture. So forgive me. I'm going to start again. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live today. It's Saturday, November 10th, 2012. Our topic today is online assessments, data collection, and you. And we're very fortunate to have our special guest today, Kat Flippin. Uh, Kim will not be with us today. Again, we're still sending out our best wishes to her. She's still not well. And we uh, extend our appreciation to Lori Moffat in the chat, who is our backup moderator, as well as uh, Tammy Moore, who is in the chat. and just. Uh, Usually, um, Tam is able to provide closed captioning but with the updates on Blackboard Collaborate. That function isn't per performing as we would like it to work. So um, it may be a couple weeks before that uh, option is back for you. Uh, for those people who have not been with us today, a reminder that or a notice that we have a great way to aggregate uh, the resources with us and we use Live Binder and I think Peggy's going to pop, drop that link. She did. Thank you very much. You'll find a complete list of the uh, resources Kat is using during the day. So if the chat goes by very quickly, don't be worried. You can use the Live Binder link to do that. As well, we have a website. Most of you know that, live.classroom20.com. But we point you to the archives and resources page because on that page we'll have the Blackboard Collaborate recording of today. You'll see it, um, an audio file, an MP4 file that is embedded so that you can take the content and post it to your blog or to a professional development uh, portal where you can share with other teachers. You'll find the chat log as well. So again, another quick way to get those links is uh, link clicking on the chat log. Uh, what we try to do with those links, if they're um, complementary to the presentation, they will be added to the blog post that Peggy puts together and the live binder. So you've got lots of different ways to give access to the content for the show. And it's great to point someone else to it when uh, they're not available for the show or they come back later. I'm going to put you to work. So you're going to find the laser pointer, which is on the whiteboard tools on the left of the whiteboard, the second option down, a little star. So if you click on that and drag it over in the world, you're going to show us where you're located. And if that doesn't work, you can type it in the chat as well. I know we have something from Azerbaijan today. Yes, Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. I'm in St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada. Are there any more Canadians with me today? Sometimes I feel a little lonely, but often people do come up. Great, got a good cross section of people across the globe. So now I'm going to put you to work with another function, and that's doing the poll question. So I'll remind you in the participants window, the right icon, if you click on it, Let's get my little hand going and you're going to answer the question. If you use digital assessments with your learners, whether in your classroom or online with adult learners, so it's a yes if you do and a no if you don't, click on that little icon, make sure you get the drop down message menu and then click on yes or no. So I'm just going to publish the results and just waiting for a few more people to vote. They're coming in still. I think we've reached the limit of who is using the option right now. So the answer to that is about 55%. That's a great uh, number to be uh, using these kinds of tools. And I know you're going to uh, enjoy some of the options that um, Kat's going to provide you today in the presentation. Here's your second poll question. Have you used QIA as an assessment or reinforcement tool? So go ahead and check if you have and Red X if you haven't. Okay, if you can't get that voting option to work, just go ahead and type it in the in the chat, yes or no. Yes, that's right, Peggy. Don't use the one on the on the screen. It is a little bit confusing if you're new to this environment. I think most people have voted so far, and of those that have voted. 
half of the people who are voting have said that they are not using it. So that, that's great information for you. Let's just let's go on to the third poll question now. Have you used Google Apps for assessment, either formative or summative? Just waiting for the votes. I can see already from the list that uh, more people are using that kind of uh, tool. And here's the results again for the people who were able to vote. Uh, almost 50%, uh, 43% are using Google Apps. Our last poll question is, have you used Socrative as an online or mobile assessment tool? Here's the results for those people who are voting. Over 50% are not, so I know that they're going to be very interested in hearing more about Socrative. So, great information for Kat as a presenter. So it is my opportunity now to welcome uh, Kat Flippen formally. Uh, our topic again is online assessments, data collection, and you. I think uh, I have the great opportunity of giving a little background about Kat, for those of you who have not met her, she's a high school instructor, uh, education researcher, a conference presenter, and a digital pedagogy leader. Um, as an educational technology evangelist, uh, she makes it her mission not only to spread the word of modern bleeding edge tech and trends in education, but also to integrate them into their own classes. So she can be an executive an example of effective and appropriate pedagogy using 21st century topics and technology. She is doing her doctoral research at the University of Florida. She's been featured both in EdSurge, EduMech, I can't say that properly, and is an active presenter at numerous conferences and webinars, including Georgia Educational Technology Conference, SD Cycle webinar series. And she also writes for Ed Research on the Disruptors Channel. And I think that's really an interesting thing is through her doctorate, she's researching, researching my voice isn't working today, she's research, researching the gamification of education. She has an expertise in introducing educators to digital footprint and social media development and some uh, other uh, mobile communication, how to use them in your classroom, providing effective and completely paperless online formative and summative assessments, as well as collecting data and conducting semester-based action research for the regular classroom. So Kat, I'm very pleased to uh, welcome you to our show today. I'm going to turn the uh, microphone over to you, and we always have a newbie question, and today is, what are the advantages of online assessments and going paperless? And I think that's going to be a great introduction to your presentation. So welcome and take it away. Well, thank you so much. And uh, thank you, Peggy, as well, both of you, for having me here. I'm so happy to see everybody and really fascinated by the fact that most of you all have, are familiar with Google, perhaps not so much with Kia, and definitely not a lot with Socrative. So I hope that today is going to be a fun day for all of you guys. And I hope you're ready. Um, to take a couple assessments yourself. So, of course, I'm not going to grade you formally, uh, but that way, you know, you're welcome to fail. Fail up, that's fine. Exactly, it is about saving trees, and, and we're going to get to, I'm actually, that's part of my answer right now. So, um, <clears throat> some of the advantages of going uh, on, with online assessments and being paperless. First of all, accessibility. Um, what's really nice about a lot of these features is, is not just laptop-based, it's also tablet-based and mobile phone-based or smartphone based. Um, and even sometimes it could very well be you know text message based. So you have a lot of different options. Um, another thing that you know was already somebody already said was a uh, conservancy if um, you are big on saving the environment. Um, or you just see, like I have seen, just people printing out packets of like 25 pages uh, you know used in one day. And it's incredible. And, to see that happen in the, in the copy room, and for example, my school right now, we only have two copiers. Um, we're a smaller school, grant, uh, granted, but having someone stand there and kind of, you know, 25 pages per student, if they have like 60 students, that's a lot of paper. So instead of doing that, you know, why not put your final exams, which are typically pretty large in size, online? It's very feasible, and uh, I'll talk about behavior management as well. 
Um, of course, there are some free options, especially for educators. And if they are paid options, they're low cost, uh, generally an annual payment of some sort or like a monthly payment of some sort that are really, really low. So because you're an educator, a lot of things are um, free or low cost. Um, also, one, things that, uh, one of the things I find to be very, very helpful uh, is absent students. So if you have a student who is absent due to illness um, or they, they conveniently forgot that they had a test that day, <laughs> go ahead, Lisa, that's fine. Um, in that case, you know, they can come back and you can be like, you don't have to interrupt your classroom. You can just have a laptop set up and be like, okay, you could just sit there and go ahead and take your test now and I'll continue on with everybody else. And it's really kind of, uh, it's, it's, it's very seamless. And if you do trust the child too, a lot of these things, uh, specifically Kia, for example, you're able to um, time the assessment. So if you really trust the child, or perhaps you can talk with the child's parent, if they're out for several days due to an illness, they, they can take the assessment at home. Um, in fact, right now, my students are taking an assessment via Kia. They have until Sunday at 11.59, and they, uh, when they open it up, they have 40 minutes to complete it. So they feel like they can't study, or they don't have to study for it, but Unfortunately, in a time setting, you do, and it will be interesting to me to find out how many students don't make it um, to the 40 minutes. And finally, uh, a teacher lifestyle improvement. I don't know about you guys, but all I do is grade. <laughs> and really, you know, we always say that being a teacher is not a 40-hour-a-week job. And about a two, two, three, two or three years ago, it, it was just so overwhelming. I was getting my master's. I was grading all the time. I did not sleep. And I thought there had to be something easier, especially when it came to assessments. I didn't want to give all multiple choice assessments. I wanted to do short answer. I wanted to do some, some sort of writing. And I needed an easier way to grade them. And online assessments was the answer for me. Not only are my short answer questions can be graded automatically, but with my longer answers or my things that are submitted, like a project-based learning, for example, uh, like a presentation or maybe a Glogster, I can just put it up on my computer or on my tablet, and I just grade right there and submit it right back. I don't print anything out. The kids don't submit anything paper-based to me. I only carry home a laptop. That's it. I don't carry home stacks of paper. So I'm just able to do my grading right there, submit it back to the students with comments embedded, and it's, it's, it's wonderful. My kids have really enjoyed that. So that was the long answer <laughs> and kind of a nice overview um, for advantages of online assessments and going paperless. And uh, I can go ahead and move on. <clears throat> so again, uh, please tweet uh, live class 2.0. Um, and I'll actually show you something I'm doing that you can use. Uh, I didn't really think about this until yesterday. I was presenting at the Georgia Educational Technology Conference on uh, mobile communication. And we, I used something, and I thought, this would be really interesting to show. So as of 30 minutes ago, I kind of added it in. So I'll show you toward the end what it looks like. Um, let's see. Moving on. Okay, again, I'm just emphasizing, please tweet. I'm a huge Twitter fanatic. I love Twitter for professional development. I'm at Kat Flippin, so feel free to follow me, and I will definitely be um, following your back channel and be responding to you probably up to three hours afterward. If you have any questions, you're welcome to send them to me or just put them in uh, chat later. And this is me. Uh, as I said earlier, I'm currently a Spanish teacher at a private institution, and I have uh, seven years prior in public institutions, uh, one in a city school district in Virginia that was a much more urban environment, which I'll be referring to today as well, and uh, another was actually in the largest school in the state of Georgia. <laughs> we had upwards of 4,000 kids. Um, and I'm also currently a doctoral student in educational technology and curriculum instruction at University of Florida. That's a huge mouthful. And uh, I am researching gamification of education, which I will be applying to my classes. So I will come back and talk about gamification one day to you guys. Moving on to the next slide here. Awesome. So assessment is not a bad word. <laughs> it, oftentimes, teachers have two, perspe two perspectives. One, they view test days as, oh my gosh, I'm going to put my hands behind my head. I'm going to sit back and just let my kids take a test, you know, 75 question test, and I'm not going to do anything. Or they see assessment as, oh my gosh, I can't do this. This is way too much work. How am I going to make sure that they don't cheat? How am I going to make sure they don't do this? And then I have to grade everything. It's, it's either very stressful or no stress at all. There's a happy medium somewhere in there. And so um, 
especially when it comes to formative assessment. I've read a lot of reading and research about formative assessment, which is essentially frequent small assessments you give that show you and your student immediately where they stand. And the formative assessment has to have immediate feedback. That's the trick. So if you want to give your quizzes on paper, I, when I started doing formative assessment, I printed out so many pieces of paper. I cut them in half to try to save them. But you know, I'm doing two or three quizzes a week, and then I have to grade them and everything. It was very time consuming. So my question for myself was, how could I conduct frequent, effective, and you know, pedagogically sound assessment within my already limited time and without feeling overwhelmed? So also, data and research. I know what you're thinking as well as your classroom educator. Not another thing for me to do. You have all your paperwork. You also have to plan. You have professional development. How can you incorporate research? And it's so important that you actually do conduct research. You do not want to be a stagnant educator. You want to be somebody who prog progresses through their, uh, <clears throat> through their instruction. So especially because just because you grade and assess does not mean that you truly know how each student is progressing. And it's very hard if you teach in a large school. When I was at Mill Creek, you know, having classrooms of, that's, not, that's the biggest school in the state of Georgia, by the way, having classes of maybe 34 kids, and you have five classes of that every day, how can you individually understand, like just visually see and try to wrap your head around each individual student progression in your class? It's difficult. And again, formative assessments are frequent and short, and they do give instant feedback. They are your answer. But again, large classes. So how can I conduct class-based research that, um, that will improve my instruction without being too challenging and time consuming? And online assessment for me was the answer. First of all, less time. Faster, you grade it quicker. I'm, and I come from about two years of doing this. Your grading is phenomenally faster. You can set it up for immediate feedback, or you will be done within 24 hours. Because again, you're not taking home loads and loads of paper. And there's like this mental block it, like this mental block. You see a giant stack of papers, and you're thinking, this is hours and hours of work. As opposed to just taking your computer or your tablet, you open up the assignment page, you look at your um, look at all the other responses, and you can just grade, you know, clicking buttons, and it really can can it can be so overwhelming. And that honestly, uh, probably about what was it like spring of 2009, I was actually almost like a wit fan. I was grading for me was just so time consuming. Um, also, with online assessment regarding the less time, it's very efficient. You make your assessment once, you never have to print it again. And you can you have it forever. So you know I, I frequently use quizzes all the time. I have a quiz from 2010 that I use every semester essentially, and I, I love that. I love that all I have to do is say, okay, I'm going to click a button, and in two days the kids are going to take that. It's made my planning so much more um, streamlined. And of course, my free-ish. <laughs> some sites are free, and some sites are pay, but they're very affordable. And uh, the most expensive site has a pretty low annual payment. And most schools, if you really ask nicely, will probably help pay, probably pay it for you, especially because it's really, really inexpensive. So again, I have more time now for planning, which, come on, that's really important. Planning, you know, if you don't plan, then you, if you, what is it, if you don't, if you fail to plan, then you plan to fail, right? Is that the saying? Also, with data collecting, I, you know, you really, you really have got to do some action research, even if it's just basic. And guess what? Online assessment can actually do that for you. And I'll show you why today. Um, also, with online assessment, and by the way, guys, <clears throat> all these things that I'm talking about here, if you want to use all this information and if you want some research behind it, just contact me. I'll send you some actual, um, like, peer-reviewed research on this, especially regarding the formative assessment. Um, that you can show your administration uh, or your district if you're trying to sell them on this, if, or if you want some support. So uh, you're better, you do have better instruction. With data, you can collect data on individual students, even if you have 150, trust me. Um, and it really is easy to illustrate progress to others. And what's nice is you can actually, if, you, if you're not a spreadsheet person, you can just upload the spreadsheet to maybe Google, like we were talking about, a Google spreadsheet. And you're able to visualize. It will, it will make charts for you, so you can easily see how your kids are doing. Um, of course, you have your own action research, which is not like big peer review scholarly research. This is just numbers that you're collecting. You can expand on your own practice constantly. You can see what works for your kids, what doesn't, and then change how it works. And finally, growth. You grow as an instructor. 
um, while your kids are also growing, they're improving on their learning as well. So it's a, you know, it's a win-win situation. <clears throat> so this is how I felt. There was so much to do, so, so little time. You know, my life was blurring by me, and I just, I did not sleep. I swear, there was no such thing as sleep. And this is online assessment for me, right there. It really makes my life just so much more organized, it's easier to manage. My planning is so much more succinct, and I actually have time. I have a 14 month old, and I'm doing my doctorate, and I'm teaching. I actually have downtime. It's, it's actually it's, it's incredible. Just because I have helped to eliminate a lot of the work with my self research that I conduct, as well as my assessment, which honestly that was what was taking up most of the time grading. Let's talk about some examples of online assessment here, and this is the one I use most frequently. <clears throat> uh, let's see about the method most important. Oh, I totally just missed somebody's amazing comment. Man, I can't backtrack. Uh, do you want to repaste your question for me really quick about uh, concerns about the message about grading? There it is. The most important part of form assess assessment, analyzing student work to inform instruction. Perhaps the end we can address this more. Um, yeah, grading is not, is not an evil, evil thing. It's just, it really can take up a lot of your time when you really need to be crunching that data. You need to be grading, you need to have the grades happen faster. And then you're able to really reflect on it more, right? Reflection is so important for teachers and we really don't have time to do that. So I don't mean to say grading is a is an evil, evil source. It's just that there's a lot of it. Um, especially, you know, I'm a fan of uh, like, um, what do I want to call this? Um, practice, I guess. Um, reinforcement activities. There we go. And I do a lot of reinforcement activities, and a lot of that actually is online too. So, you know, I, it's not just about, hmm, it's not just about cutting down, you know, eliminating grading altogether. There is still some grading aspect to it, but it's about making it easier for teachers. Because if you're a classroom teacher, you know how difficult um, it can be where you're trying to, you know, keep tabs of every student. You're trying to plan. You have professional development. You're trying to do all this other stuff outside of school. You also have a family which is just one way to kind of make it happen a little easier. So moving on, we have a uh, Kia right here. This is what I really use um, most frequently when it comes to assessments, including uh, my big quizzes and even my final exams and my midterms are on here. Um, on here, it also has games um, and also surveys, and I'll show you one, actually one that you guys are, will be doing for me later. Uh, assessments can include a lot of features, which is great for me as a foreign language teacher. We have images, audio, video, audio, video and links. Uh, you have a variety of question types, and you can scramble not just the questions, but the answer choices themselves, which is nice because let's say you have a particular order for the questions, you can scramble the answer choices so everybody sitting next to each other has different answer choices. So it could actually be obvious who's cheating and who's not. <clears throat> and whoops, I went far too ahead here. The cost is free uh, with limited features. And if you want more features, it is a paid yearly subscription. And this is the most expensive thing I'm talking about here. It is $40 a year. Uh, previously, my schools have not paid for it, but this year I'm at a school that does pay for it. So it doesn't hurt to ask. It never hurts to ask. Um, oh, it's 49 now. I know they, go, they, they probably just have such a huge amount of people flocking toward them because it's such a popular program. But they do have an option for limited features as well. Um, and it is very easy to use. And there is a little bit of time commitment when you have to develop your assessments, but isn't there always? Uh, and I'm actually going to um, give you guys a link in chat to uh, a certain final exam. And I'm going to have you test it out. Now, you don't have to put your real name. I would actually ask my students. They would, it would require them a login. It really is that. It really is reasonable for a year, especially because Glockster was, I had, actually I had a quick blog through. That was $10 a month. I, I couldn't do that. Um, and VoiceThread was $80 a year. So this is possibly one of the things that um, was least expensive for me. But there is your link. I want you to hop on there and you can make up a name. You can be Angelina Jolie. And uh, see what it looks like. And I'm actually going to join you in on this as well. And then I'll show you what it looks like in the background. So if you did come in there, you can see that you can play audio, and I, you're able to embed audio. So with their listening, if you're a foreign language teacher, one of my biggest pet peeves was playing audio like over the classroom speakers, or when I didn't have speakers, I had this little tiny stereo. Not everybody can hear it. You only get to play it twice. 
I mean, if that's not really showing you what they understand. So my kids have the option of listening to it several times and really trying to comprehend it, especially within a final exam environment. They get so nervous. I want to support them in showing me what they have learned. So I'm able to embed audio individually. Uh, also, if you scroll down, you'll see images. <clears throat> so and that actually goes along with audio. Um, I was able to make their reading assignments bigger, uh, made their um, font bigger too, so it's easier to see. And I mean, it's a long, this is a very, very long one. <coughs> and it was actually um, standardized. We had to have these many questions within our county. So go ahead and answer a couple of them. You don't have to be correct. And I want you to click, click a submit answers. And I'm just going to press one button and submit. And then I'm going to show you what it looks like from my end. So here we go for some app sharing. OK, so you should be seeing uh, what I see right here. This is um, for the final exam. This is the second semester final exam for Spanish 1. And what's so nice about Kia is the data that it pushes out for me. I can go question by question. It shows me the average score, number of students who receive the question, and number of students who receive full credit. So, you know, you really want to be the judge of sound pedagogical assessment approaches here. So I'm going to scroll down, and you'll see, look at these questions, 27, 28, and 29. That's only 5%. That was the average score. There's a couple things here that seem really challenging to my kids at that time. So if I was doing this as a formative assessment or perhaps as a midterm, I could actually see, well, you know, these kids really struggled right here. And I'm not ashamed to show you guys that, you know, this is the final exam. The kids were still really struggling right there. So, you know, I didn't do as much as I feel like I should have at that point. Um, and I, I'm able to improve my teaching for the next semester. I'm constantly improving what I'm doing. So that's question by question. What's nice here, of course, it gives me student by student. And then if I go and I grade a student, of course, he actually made 100. I'm going to go here. And I click on the little pencil. And it shows me the grading overview, question by question as well. And what's nice is I can go back and I can reward points. So let's say if he made a 0 right here in number 4, and I thought that it was right, I can go back and put a 1, and they'll uh, tabulate that for me. So I'm able to see very individual um, progress within assessments. Also with Kia, <clears throat> you can do surveys. And I'll be giving you this survey today as well. And of course, it's not totally optional. With my students, though, I find surveys um, is really an important form of uh, informal assessment. I like to know where they stand and how they feel. Um, it makes them feel like I care, and I do. <laughs> And I want to know where they feel they need extra help. I want to know what they felt they didn't understand. Because sometimes they just sit there and stare at me, and they won't give me feedback. And a lot of the beauty of online assessment and online tools is it kind of takes away that person-to-person -person fear that some students have, the intimidation they might have talking to you. Um, it creates a little bit of a safety barrier. And I get a lot more feedback from students online. <clears throat> so a survey is set up a very similar way from a final exam. And I'll show you how the final exam is set up as well. So you have a, several different option choices for a survey. You have yes, no, pop-up, ranking, rating scale. Um, when it comes to final exam, I'm going to go here. And I'm actually going to enter key so I can show you where to access it. I'll go under my quizzes. And I'll scroll down and find my uh, semester. There we go, final exam. I'll click Edit. <coughs> And there we go. So I can just go page by page right here where it says insert. I'll select one or more questions. And it'll pop up. And I can choose the question type. I can choose multiple choice, true, false, pop up, multiple correct, fill in, initial, short answer, even essay. And yes, I have done a lot of essays. I feel that typing in four languages is a, is a key skill in the digital era, uh, matching and ordering. And of course, some non graded survey questions, actually, you can tack on to the end of an assessment, which is nice. So they have a lot of um, features here. Now back to the grading section here. There's a lot of things you can do with each assessment as well. So here's a copy of my midterm from uh, spring 2012. You can preview it. Reports essentially makes a, an Excel document for you. So you can actually feed that to Excel and you can crunch some data in there. Um, you can make a copy of it. So for example, the final that you see right now, I'm going to make a copy of it and change the link for later. And I'm going to remix it. And you know, use it as some other thing, maybe a midterm at some point. 
Uh, you can print results, and of course you can export them too. So if you want to upload them into um, some other service, and it, it creates, I think it's a CDS file or a CSV file. Uh, you can also send results to an archive, which kind of uh, just saves the material and cleans up your, your view, and of course you can delete. So there's a lot of things that um, you can do in Kia that I enjoy. And I do have uh, activities, which are essentially games. And it's not just games for game's sake. Uh, I do a lot of my reinforcement activities on here as well. The kids really enjoy it from an intro perspective and also a review perspective. And so now I'm going to go back to the screen. If uh, Peggy, if you can put me on back onto the uh, slides. Thank you so much. And I'm going to talk quickly about, oh, <laughs> I sincerely hope that they do. Um, <clears throat> Edmodo, uh, I'm sure people are familiar with this, also Schoology. Uh, it's a Facebook-like interface. And uh, you can actually do assessment in there as well. Uh, they mostly do just objective fill in the blank and long answer. Um, it's very, uh, you also do class specific assignment, uh, assigning. So if you have your classes developed, uh, you can say, well, this quiz is for this class, first period, and then I want my second period to have a completely different quiz so they don't know what's coming. And they have a social feature too, and it is totally free right now. I'm getting to that. So that's, that's nice. That's very nice. Um, the social feature is really cool because uh, kids can actually comment on the quiz. So when I post a quiz, they'll comment, and I often get things like, oh, my gosh, that was so difficult, or I think I did great. So I get some informal feedback right away. Uh, and it is very easy to use. And there is, again, some setup time commitment. But once you have your, um, your stuff developed, then you're fine. And I will actually show you what I'm talking about really quick. And Moto just redid, if you haven't been there recently, they just redid um, <clears throat> some of their their interface, essentially. And it says host and pause. So I'm going to see what we've been sharing. OK, so I'm going to show you Edmodo. There you go. And uh, just so you know, I want to show you the social feature. Right here, my students were doing an assignment online. They were doing a document they were going to submit online. Uh, we use something called Haiku right now, which is uh, hooked up with Google Apps. So they did a document, either a Google Doc or a Word Doc, and submitted it to me online, which I graded. I just on my tablet, just using, and it was so easy. I have a little PDF thing. I convert it to PDF, grade it, send it back to them. It's, it's, it's very fast. It sounds faster than it actually is. So here, they were actually able to help each other out, which is so cool. So let's say I want to uh, assign a quiz. I'll create, click on quiz, and I can load a previously created quiz. So I can, I can select one of these quizzes and reassign it. So I'll select that quiz. I can get a due date. I can add it to my grade book. And I can send now, and I can schedule it. So once you create a quiz, and they're really easy to make, you can just keep on reusing it. And of course, it goes straight to your grade book, so the kids can see it, and they can actually comment on, comment it, on it as well. And I'm going to go back to my slides again, Peggy, if you don't mind. Thank you. All right, um, something else that I really enjoyed, and if you are a, an elementary school teacher or perhaps a middle school teacher, this might be more for you. Um, Discovery Education is a great resource. It provides you a, a web page, essentially, a landing page where you can post all of these links. Um, it does basic assessments. It also collects basic data. Uh, it also is very easy to use, very easy to use. And if you do have a Discovery Education website, you can just integrate it right away. I'm so happy people know what I'm talking about. Uh, and they do have amazing videos. That's right, Lisa. So they have some great instructional resources. But from, a <clears throat> from this point of view, it, it's, it's great for assessment as well. And it is free. It's only accessible to schools and districts that have a code, but almost everybody does. Uh, very, um, it's very easy to use, uh, and I think for setup time, it really is not that difficult. Uh, whenever I, try, whenever I've used it and I've experimented, experimented it with it with it in the past, it seems, you know, really intuitive. Which, um, you know, being a teacher, if you're if you're pressed for time, you don't want to have to necessarily learn something completely new. You want something that's a little easier to use. So I do have a link right there um, that's essentially how to form a quiz on Discover Education. Uh, so if you have time and you want to go back, and yeah, you can totally do it yourself. Oh, yeah, totally. All of this stuff, you could do yourself. Um, some of it has a higher learning curve than others. I would say that Kia has a high learning curve. Um, at Modo, though, I, I would say definitely not a high learning curve. And they have such amazing support. And Discovery Education, I feel like, is 
one of the most supportive sites you can use. So if you really need help, you're able to um, you're able to find help within that community because there is a whole community on discovery education. You can probably post a question to the forum and somebody will help you immediately. So uh, I highly recommend discovery education, especially for those of you uh, elementary school teachers. Um, it seems like the interface really uh, bodes well with the younger kids. Um, something that has a high learning curve, <laughs> speaking of, um, are Google Forms. Uh, you would use your drive, the Google Drive, and something called Fluberoo. And I'm, I'm sure that some of you have heard about Fluberoo before. Uh, but let's say on Google you create a form, and there you can create quizzes and surveys pretty quickly once you get the hang of it. And then the hard part comes when you have to connect Fluberoo, which is a script of sort. It's essentially something called a script. Um, and it automatically sets up your grading. So you can uh, go into Flooper, you can say, okay, well, this one is this answer, and this one is this answer. And it feeds onto your spreadsheet, which is what your form answers feed onto, and it grades it right there for you. This is really, it, it sounds as hard as it actually is. Granted, it's free. And once you get the hang of it, it's really easy to use, because you can essentially just copy the forms that you previously made, remix them a little bit into whatever you need, and everything is already set up. So. Initially, it's a pretty high learning curve, but once you get the hang of it, it moves pretty quickly. Um, also, I have on there as well instructions. Uh, Fluberu has a great just single page how to do this in layman's terms instructions. So if you're interested in incorporating Fluberu in Google Drive, especially if you're a school either using Google Apps for Education or thinking about incorporating Google Apps for Education, this would be great for you. Now, what you've all been waiting for, again, um, finding it really surprising that a lot of you haven't heard about this, uh, one of my favorite things is Socrative. So they have a general website for information and for teachers to create their login. Uh, and then they have, once you have a login, you have a teacher dashboard. And your teacher dashboard, dashboard is located at t.socrative.com. And I will be going there in a second. And you will be going to uh, m.socrative.com in just one moment as well. So what can it do for you? Oh, it can do so much. You have assessments, uh, def really, really easy assessments. You can also do surveys, exit tickets. Uh, you can also, there's a game feature, which is fa fascinating, uh, considering the fact that Socrative is very, very mobile. Uh, you can also include short and long answers on any device. Exit ticket includes feedback questions and one review question. Now, here's the thing about Socrative that sells me. It can go on any device. It can be your iPhone, your Android. It can be Blackberry, any kind of smartphone. It can also be any tablet and laptop or desktop. Socrative is you know, a cross-platform program, which is amazing. So if you're a tablet school, this is for you. If you're a BYOD school, this is for you. If you are just a laptop one-to-one -one school, this is for you as well. If you are a school that only has maybe 30 desktops and one classroom that everybody can use, this is for you too. Everybody can use this. And guess what? It's free. <laughs> no cost. So you're able to go on here, sign up, and you're able to use it. There is a limit. Um, I think in only one assessment, you can only have 50 participants. So um, considering how many people might be on here right now, some of you might, might not be able to use it, but I will try to show you what it looks like. Um, as for ease of use, once you get the hang of it, it's great. But of course, there is some setup time, and it, it, the user interface is kind of interesting. So you have to get used to it. But again, once you're used to it, it's, it's so easy. Okay, so let's play. I want you to go to m.socrative.com. And I have the link in chat. Or rather, let me try that again. Thank you, Peggy. You're amazing. And here is the room number I want you to go to. 886851. So once you go to m.socrative.com, you're going to type in the room number, 886851. And what you will see is waiting for the teacher and a little circle that goes round and round and round. And then I'm going to go ahead and share <coughs> what the teacher desk looks like, and I'm going to give you a quiz. So uh, if you're at m.socrative.com, if you use 886-851, that is my room. And keep in mind that Socrative is limited to 50 users per activity. If we have more than 50 right now, you can, I'm, I'm terribly sorry, you can watch what I'm doing right now. <coughs> uh, 
Okay, so right now I have 30 people here in the room. And I'll refresh and see if that number has gone up. 33 people. Awesome, y'all. Um, and I'm going to scroll down here. I have previously made quizzes. You have to make your quizzes beforehand. And I can also give you a single question. Let's say that I want to give you a quick warm-up question. I'll just click right here on multiple choice, true, false, or short answer. And when you walk into the room, I'll say go here, answer the question, and then open this up. And that way you can get your immediate intro question. So for bell ringers, for um, <clears throat> activities, for intro activities, this is great. Now I'm going to give you a pre-made quiz. So I click start quiz, and now I'm going to click one of my saved quizzes here. I'm going to click, uh, I'm going to give you the test quiz I actually give to my students. <laughs> this is so I can show them how Socratum works. Now I can make it student paced, in which you guys can take your time answering, or I can make it teacher paced. And just for, you know, posterity's sake here, I'm going to make it um, student paced. And so now, if you are on m.socratum.com, uh, also, there's apps for that on Android or, Android or iPhone. You are able to see right now a quiz. It'll ask for your name. In this case, you don't have to give me your name if you don't want to. And then you'll have a question, which I'm not looking for the right answer, I promise. And that's it. And I actually clicked right now on live results so I can see who all is taking their test. So let's say that, you know, <clears throat> Patty, let's say that maybe you're taking a long time. I can see that other people are, you know, progressing just fine and you're going kind of slow. I want to go over and I can actually go to you and ask what's up. And then uh, once you're done, you can, you can hide live results and just end activity. I'll give you a second to kind of explore. And again, if you're that, if you're the type of student who's trying to actually answer that question, <laughs> good on you. <laughs> I, I'm not a math person at all. And so once you're done, all you're going to see again is that round and round circle. Now, what's really cool about this, let's say that you are in a BYOD environment and you only have half your kids that have a device of some sort. The crowded has it enabled where the kid can, one kid can actually share the device with the friend next to them. There's a button that at the end of your assignment that you can press that says share with another student and you can pass it over to the other student and they can just go ahead and take it as well. And it, and you know, no, no data is mixed up. Nobody's sharing answers. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, end the activity here. So if you're taking it, you know, you run out of time. So I'm going to end activity. And what pops up there is I have a couple choices. I can say email report or download report or no report at all. And I'm just going to actually X out because I can download it later. I'm going to click no report. And then what I can do is go back here, <clears throat> go to Manage Quizzes, and I can scroll down and see there was our test quick quiz from today. And then I can send my report again, or I can download the report. So you actually never lose your data. Let's say you know if you're on different computers, you're able to access it everywhere. So and that's just one beauty of this. And we'll also try later on um, an exit ticket. Um, also, there's space race if you're really into vocab or perhaps you want to put in some math assignments, you're able to do that as well. Uh, but Socrative, again, the beauty of it is it's free and you're able, it's, it's cross device. You're able to use any device, whether that be, you know, a, a 2000 era computer all the way up to tablet one to one schools. So, um, very, very <coughs> user friendly. And I'm going to go back to my slides if you don't mind, Peggy. Thank you so much. Okay. Now, some other online tools that I have experimented with here and there that I don't use very frequently. Uh, for quiz builders, there's a Pro Pro Quiz Maker. Uh, and most of these, by the way, are free or they are very cheap, like cheap monthly payments. Um, Zoho, I've heard a lot about, but I haven't experimented too much with. It's the same thing with Tesmos and Quizstar. Now, what I have experimented with is a lot. It's something called Nearpod. If you are a, um, an iPad one-to-one -one school, Nearpod is your friend. You're able to push out, uh, like if you have your tablet and they have their tablet, you can press a button and on their tablet, pop up the quiz just like that. So Nearpod is, is incredible for, for sharing, for looking at what your kids are, kids are doing on their tablet and also um, getting assessments out to them really quickly. So again, iPad one-to-one -one school Nearpod is amazing. <clears throat> I see some other people have used Zoho as well. So 
this, I don't know, and it's going at the end of, oh, I'm so sorry that it's leaving, because all these are amazing. I know, in your pod, it's so incredible, the fact that you can just deliver content, like, snap of the fingers. So I, I love Nearpod, and granted, I'm not at a one-to-one -one tablet school, but I have some kids who use iPads, and, you know, I have them come in, and we experiment, experiment with them a little bit. And I see some people who use Quizstar. So, again, a lot of these things are available to you. Just do a Google search for them, and, you know, you can always experiment. As a teacher, it's our job to experiment and find things that work for us. Now, for reinforcement and project-based learning, because, as we know, assessment is not necessarily a multiple choice test. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, <clears throat> you're also able to do activities that help review um, or just re activities that really help solidify certain things that you, you've instructed in class. So, again, Kia and Enmoto are great for this. Kia has those games that I was talking about, the activities. They have some JavaScript activities as well. Enmoto, I love um, with my students for project based learning in particular, they can upload anything from a, a Google Doc link to um, a Word document to a PowerPoint presentation to actually pages, uh, Microsoft uh, <clears throat> Mac pages as well, and they're able, I'm able to grade it right there and send back comments to them. So Edmodo is great for paperless project-based learning grading. Um, Quizlet is something I use, uh, and it's not just foreign language based. It's um, not just flashcards either. There's games. There's uh, activities for um, writing things out what you hear. Uh, there's a whole group on there that does math. There's visuals you can do. So Quizlet is amazing, and they have apps for that. And it is free. I know, Peggy, it's free. I use Quizlet very frequently with my students. Um, and the mobile version of Quizlet is amazing, and they do have, they, they particularly have an iPhone and iPhone app. And when it comes to Android and other platforms, they have apps like Flashcardlet, I believe also is on Android, but there's a whole list of them on the Quizlet website as well, and also for BlackBerry too. Um, do any of the online quiz options allow students to review their answers and check over their quiz? Yes, Kia does. Kia does that. Um, you, you, have a, you have things you can enable. You can enable it where they don't see anything at all. You can uh, enable it where they just see that they got the wrong answers. So, for example, some of my formative assessments, especially in the study I did uh, last spring semester that I'm going to talk about in a second, I let my kids look and see where they got it wrong and then retake the quiz to see if maybe they could get it right. So <clears throat> that's available as well. And then, of course, you have your one time, here's all your answers, and this is where you got it wrong. So Kia does do that for you. WordChamp, uh, any foreign language, so how do the tools compare with the quiz feature in Moodle? Moodle, is, uh, Moodle for me is not a very user-friendly format. Um, for some reason, it's just a very, I guess, clunky for me now that I've had a lot of experience with all these other things. But if you're in Moodle school, go ahead and incorporate it, you know. And you can also, what's, what's really cool about some of these things right here is you can embed a lot of this into Moodle as well. Um, WordChamp, <clears throat> it is really ideally for foreign language teachers, so all my foreign language teachers present right now, this is your friend. Uh, I am on there, so you can kind of look for the things that I do. And I do have a web reader as well, so if you're a foreign language teacher, you can assign an article, and they can uh, open the article within WordChamp and scroll over individual words. <clears throat> and it will translate those words for them. So it kind of helps with uh, literacy in a different language. When it comes to project-based learning, VoiceThread is amazing because nothing is better than actually leaving an audio commentary on what a student has worked on. So my kids recently actually uploaded a writing assignment into VoiceThread, and then I had them narrate it too, so I was able to give them a speaking grade. Um, and then what I did is I went back and I left comments for them with, on my voice, so it seemed very personal to them. It wasn't just an A, B, C, or D. Uh, now, VoiceThread, unfortunately, again, if you really want the full effect of it, it's expensive. It's 80 bucks, but that's only if you want to give your students accounts through you. Your students can create free accounts themselves, and they can just submit the links to you. Perhaps you can hear something else with Google Forms. Create a Google Form, <clears throat> and it's an assignment submitter form. They go to this, they put their name, they put the link to your assignment, you have them all, 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 um, what was it? I can't think of my word. They're all um, collected into uh, one spreadsheet for you using just the Google form. So that way, you know, if I didn't want to have 80 bucks a year and have my kids connected to me through VoiceThread, I could just get their individual links and go into their individual links and leave comments. 
Um, also, if you're into gaming and gamification, and maybe one day I can talk about this again as well, Community Game Lab is a um, it's currently closed beta. It will be open beta soon. Uh, if you're into quest-based learning and mastery learning, this is it for you right here. It, it, it has programmed uh, badges. You can actually enter a badge for, let's say, a student completes a, a series of quests, five quests through maybe um, trigonometry. And if they've completed all their quests sufficiently enough, you can award a badge, and that badge could represent an A for those activities. So that's more of a mastery learning approach, not necessarily just A, B, C, D, F, but more of an A through F scale. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, you're welcome to contact me. And uh, we can talk about this as well. <clears throat> so again, some people are very skeptical and critical of this. And I want to address some of this. How do you monitor cheating? And this is, um, first of all, with, with Kia, you can actually mix up the question choices as well as the questions, that's fine. But that's not enough. There's something about digital learning in general. Kids working online with a tablet or a phone or a computer that changes classroom behavior management entirely. You would assume that in a blended learning environment that your kids are on the laptops, that you would be on a laptop as well. That is not the case, you guys. You actually have to be up and mobile. You have to be behind them looking over their shoulder. You have to know what to look for. You have to change along with the instruction. So you cannot just assume that you can feed out the quiz and then be done. Be that teacher that sits back and is like, oh, the test is. That does not exist anymore when it comes to online learning in general. If you're going to do any online activity in your classroom, it's your responsibility to be up and behind them and active and on your feet. You are a facilitator now. You're not just an instructor. You are a facilitator. You're making sure that they're on task that if they get confused, you, that you find it, because they're not always going to ask you questions. So that's how I monitor cheating. I am behind them. I use, um, <clears throat> I actually uh, got an Apple TV, and with my Mac, I hooked it up to my LCD projector. Um, Apple TV is actually really expensive with a one-time fee of $99. It's not so bad, but this way I am not tethered to any LCD projector at all. I walk around with my laptop in my hand, and I, um, well, with intellectual honesty policy, we'll see. Oh, I'll get to that, that, that in a little bit, Lisa. Um, and that way I'm able to look over their shoulders. Now, what about handwriting? You know, all the people who are like, isn't production by handwriting important? Not everything is digitized. Yeah, but who's to say that, you know, the other work in your class is not handwritten? It's up to you, you know, to define what your classroom is. This is just me telling you guys how you can make some of this stuff easier for you. But, for example, I still have some handwriting activities, definitely. And, yeah, that's difficult to grade, but, you know, it's my responsibility to grade them. So this is, this is not me saying everything you do should be online. This is me saying that here's some stuff that you could do that saves paper and saves time and is, crunches data for you so you can conduct your own classroom research. But not everything is meant to be online. <clears throat> so um, if you have any other uh, questions to discuss, I will add in a little bit, I have a collaborative Google Doc that I will put the link in chat here shortly um, as I move on here because we're a little short on time. So uh, how it works for me as a real teacher. First of all, surprise, <laughs> I have a door prize for you guys. Um, I was able to get a one-year full subscription to Kia for free. So um, I want you to go back to m.socrative.com if you would. And I want you to wait for the activity to start. In just a little bit, I'm going to put up, um, all I really want is your name, and I have to have your name for this, and your email address. And I do ask for your Twitter handle, just for my own per personal sake. Uh, I want to, I love following people on Twitter. So let me uh, enable this here. I'm going back to my screen, and I'm going to pick my quiz that I made. And I'm going to do uh, student paste. All right, so if you are on n.socrative.com, oh, let me put my classroom link back in my room number, 886-851. There you go. Go to n.socrative.com, 886-851. Go ahead and take a second and uh, fill in your information for me. And I will use um, a feature that I use a lot for... Uh, <clears throat> classroom that I want to randomly pick people. It's called randompicker.com, go figure. And I will use that as soon as I get that Excel document in everybody's name. Uh, email is just 
So, and if you just want to put your name right now, if you are really shy about sharing information, just go ahead and put your name. Email so that I can email you after all this, if you have one, um, to go ahead and get all the information exchange that I would need to send the key so they can uh, make your account for you. So you don't have to do that right now. <clears throat> and while you guys are doing that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, narrate. It is a lot of fun to be able to use something, uh, you know, in practice here. Um, and while you guys are doing that again, I want to talk about how I've used online assessment action research. Because yes, I've done it. <laughs> and it was a huge success for me. And that's why I became a, uh, a great fan of online assessment. So I completed action research in my Spanish 1 classes um, spring of 2012. And there is a link on SlideShare as well. And I believe it's my, the, the presentation is... Uh, Let's see. Well, most of it right here is covered. So if you have the link to this presentation, you're fine. So my target group, you always want to set a target group. And I set my target group for my Spanish 1 classes. Um, and what's funny is, because I took it off to my fall semester of 20, uh, 2011, I had maternity leave. I just took the semester off. And I came back. So all my students were new to me. And I had mostly 9th, 10th, 11th graders. Only had one senior. <clears throat> but the problem I had, and I always pretest. Everybody was stronger in way different topics because they had just come from teachers who were, who were very, very different. And there was no way I could rightfully start a new chapter without these kids being kind of on having the same starting point. You want to have a strong foundation, right? You don't want to build a house on a weak foundation. So before I could really get into some of the hard stuff, I, was, um, <clears throat> I, I, I really wanted to do something. So I uh, created an intervention. And this is my implementation plan for my inter interventions here. I decided that um, I would have two weeks worth of intensive study with reinforcement activity. And again, my, I'm a huge fan of formative assessments. I aim for three to, four to, three to four formative assessments each week. I actually ended up with eight in total. And they were not more than 10 to 15 minutes in length. Um, everything was administered online for that immediate feedback, and especially because students were able to retake the formative assessment within 24 hours. So they took it once, they could see where they made their mistake, and I allowed them to take it again. I didn't want them to be afraid of their failures. And then, of course, my post test was administered online on the 15th day. <clears throat> so again, I did the a formative assessment online, the student assessment was online, and all, everything was able for immediate feedback. All their reinforcement was online as well. Everything was paperless, essentially. This is my big experiment, trying to make sure every, every kid would be able to start. It was chapter four. They were able to start chapter four on the same footing. And so with Kia, that's the, I collected the data. And this is an example of a quiz I gave on Kia, 20, 20 question quiz on SARE versus a star. If you're a Spanish teacher or you're familiar with Spanish, you know how hard SARE versus a star is. <laughs> so, and they were able to get their um, question by question um, answers. And so the kids knew immediately, well, I might be good with this, but I might not be good with that. So it helped them see and for me to see where they struggled in particular as opposed to just having like an overall understanding that oh, well, they're having difficulty somewhere. <clears throat> so here's an example of the data I collected. The target group average, uh, quiz 1 was 66, all the way up to quiz 8 was 89%. You can actually see a remarkable increase of scores. And one thing I want to study again in the future is whether it was the online formative assessment that helped increase it, or was it just the formative assessment? So that's another study for the future. And here are my pre-test to post-test results, where um, my pre-test was pretty uh, low data as compared to my post-test. And uh, let's see, <clears throat> standard deviation, my effect size was really, really large, where my minimum value was 72 or 38. And my pre-test, y'all, that's really, really low, up to 72. My average increased from 74 to 87. And at that point, I was really, really astounded about how well the whole thing worked. And that's why I'm presenting today. So if you have any questions, I think I just hit the 1 p.m. mark. <laughs> if you have any questions or comments, you know, this would be the time. And I do have a survey that I would like you to complete on Kia. Um, and I want to make sure that's up and going. So if you have time and you don't have to at all, I just want a little bit of feedback about what you think about all these things and uh, how you might incorporate them in your classroom. So any of your information, again, this is my own formative assessment for me, right? I just completed um, a presentation, and I would like to have you guys grade me, of course. So let me go ahead and 
crunched my door prize results. If uh, somebody wants to go ahead and collect all my questions, I will happily answer anything that you guys send my way. And I will have your results shortly. Great. I'm, I took down several questions. And um, one of them was, how do you deal with having enough computers for kids to use? Well, that's that's actually a great question. Um, <clears throat> at Mill Creek, for example, we're this giant school, and we only had six computer labs, and I believe there was 30, maybe 32 per lab, and that doesn't guarantee that everything's working, right? So I just ended up having to do a blended learning environment where at times I would have half the class working on their assessment online, and the other class would be doing something else, not necessarily online. They would be doing some kind of project-based something, actually building something with their hands, or producing some sort of reinforcement activity, doing some sort of group speaking project, something else separate from the computers. So it, it's a way, you know, you can't always depend on having all the technology there. So you might have to double plan it, but, you know, once after, the, when the time is set, you can just switch uh, groups and everything worked out fine. I had to do that a lot at Mill Creek. Um, also at Charlottesville High, um, we had one one math lab that was amazing, but that was it. We only had the one math lab, and the other lab that was available for foreign language teachers was a little antiquated. So taking my kids up there, you know, I wasn't guaranteed that everything would work. So I would have to say, well, you know, if it's not working for you right now, do this other activity that I have available right here, and then when somebody else is done, you can switch. So. You make allowances wherever you have to. Did I answer your question? Yes, it sure did. And do you have the results of the um, door prize? Because I know some people need to do it. Yeah, definitely. Actually, it's just calculating. It's calculating. Okay. Do we have a William Bauer? If you want to like raise your hand, give me a woot woot. Yay! All right, William, and I have your email. You've gotten a year subscription to Kia. Congratulations. Congrats, and not Bill. Also on Twitter. Yay! Oh, Bill. Okay, Bill. Thank you. And he I'll send you the email here, after so. this. <laughs> okay. Awesome. Thank you. And I'll send the email immediately after this so we can get your information and get you hooked up. Uh, Thank any you other questions? So much. We have some more questions. I'm going to go mm -hmm. ahead and officially close out the show because we want to be uh, mindful of your of everyone's time and sure. uh, we understand if you have to go but if you can stay uh, we would love for you to do so we want to let you know that uh, Steve Hargadon and Lucy Gray are going to be hosting the Global Education Conference and those are free sessions and it's just about 24 hours um, a day from starts Monday and there are sessions on all types of global education and of course, there's gamification. I know there's the online assessment sessions, um, some great things to check out. So be sure to check out that free uh, conference. And there will be recordings if you're unable to miss some of the live uh, sessions. But it's just about 24 hours, so you may want to check that out. And on Tuesday, um, Steve will be interviewing Kiran on teaching kids to take charge. On the 27th, he'll be interviewing Charles Hayes. And on Thursday, uh, the 29th, he'll be interviewing Jim Groom. And those are going to be great interview sessions after the conference um, that you're going to want to check out. And we want to let you know that on November 17th, we're going to have another featured teacher monthly session with Stephen Davis. And again, I mentioned the conference. On the 24th, we won't have a show due to the Thanksgiving holiday in the United States. And on December the 1st, we will have the Ignite Parent Presenter, Math Teacher, and High School Principal. So those are some great sessions. You're going to want to make sure that uh, you're able to join us for those times. We also would love for you to nominate a featured teacher and the link is in the live binders, and we love any educator that works with teachers or students. Please um, give us that information. You can also put that information in today's survey. 
The survey will automatically open as soon as you exit the session. You don't have to do anything. Or you can also click on the link that Peggy put in the chat. Anytime you view one of the recordings on our archives page, you can also fill out that same survey link that's um, in the Live Binder. And then you can also get a professional development certificate. Just put your name and email address on the survey. And Peggy will get that out to you over the weekend. And then you can submit that to your campus or district. We want to let you know we have an iTunes U channel. And the link is in our Live Binders link. And you could subscribe to the video, the MP4s or the audio, the MP3, um, individually or the full collection when we update it each week, as well as you can subscribe via an RSS feed with any um, RS feed aggregator and get all of the information and resources and live binder links that way as well. We want to give a very special thanks to our guest today, Kat, and to Steve Hargadon, who's the founder of our webinar series and Weebly and to each of you for sharing um, in the session each and every week. We're really uh, grateful for that. And now we'll move back to uh, some of the questions that I, that I happened to take down and then move to Lori. And somebody asked, and I think, I think it was Lisa, um, do all formative assessments need to be graded? That's a really interesting question. Um, I would, I mean, the purpose of formative assessment is for the immediate feedback. But if you do it frequently enough and the kids really catch on to it, I don't see why you would have to grade every single formative assessment. Because some of it also is showing the kids essentially what they know and what they don't and how familiar they are with the activities. So I would imagine that. No, you don't have to grade every single formative assessment. But I would say at the beginning of the semester, yes. But only do it once the kids understand the purpose of the formative assessment. Good question. And I agree, the other Lisa. Um, feedback's not the same as grading. And you just mm -hmm. pick and choose what, what you need. And again, I don't think everything needs to be graded, but that that's my opinion. You just do what works best for you. And we'll get that live mm -hmm. binder link, Bill. Another question was, um, have you found Kia to be more useful than an online textbook um, with those features? <laughs> That's also a really a very applicable question to my life right now. A lot of what I'm using uh, for my Spanish classes, I use a series called Realidades, which is Realities. And they have an online textbook. And while I'm a fan of their setup for the content, I don't like so much their um, assessment features, it seems very garbled and not really organized. Kia for me is so much more smoother and much more succinct. It's easier to reuse things. And I have the ability to do all the data crunching with Excel uh, documents and you know go question by question. I can't really do that with my own textbook materials. So maybe it depends on whatever company you're using. Uh, but for, for my purposes, I use Kia for all my assessments. And that has also to do with your um, infrastructure and your network, what um, and your filter and your AUP, all of those things you need to check out um, yes. and, and see what's accessible and what's not and mm -hmm. um, applicable in your district. Mm -hmm. um, somebody asked, how did you do the pictures? But I know, I think it was Kia that had the um, aviary uh, picture editor. I think that's um, well, what with the, with the pictures, oh no, Edmodo has the aviary um, picture editor. Okay. So, yeah, and it has, it's an app that's free for teachers and students in the, in the Edmodo app store they have now. But with Kia, <clears throat> I, um, I'd actually just made a screenshot. This is kind of old fashioned here, but I had this older PC when I was at uh, Mill Creek. So when I made these, I uh, pressed the, pre the print screen button. I went into paint and I pasted the picture and then I kind of cut around it and then I uploaded it. You have a little uh, a space on okay. Kia on the left hand frame that's meant for uploading to images. And I haven't been able, Steve, to add images to uh, Google Forms even using the HTML 
um, I haven't found a way to do that yet. I don't know right, if anybody has been successful. It's it's um what I understand incredibly difficult. So that's one of the disadvantages of Google Forms is you're not able to put in pictures or upload audio. Really and truly, it's more of just a, a data aggregator. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't successful when I tried it. And let me. Um, Somebody asked, does it support Unicode characters so it could be used in world language classes? Um, I think that was Kia. Kia oh, yes. Kia does. I mean, I'm a foreign language teacher, so I'll give it to you. Kia does. Yes. And Moto does not. Uh, you will have to actually cut and paste from a Word document, and your kids will have to do the same if you wanted that. So with Edmodo, I actually have to aim if, when I was using that frequently. Um, if I did the quiz builder, I would have to aim for answers that did not have accents. Um, but I use Enmodo more for project-based learning anyway. So they just upload the stuff there, and I can just grade it there. I don't use it for quizzes so much. Uh, Socrates, it depends on your students' devices. Uh, I'm able, you can just, using your keyboard shortcuts, you can type in your answers with whatever. And for your students, they would have to just be familiar about how to um, type in their accents. But it does support that. Um, Discover Education does support the typing in as well. But what's nice about Kia is uh, you can actually select uh, a language. You can say, is this test in any other language? And you can select Spanish. And there is a floating box that follows the students as they scroll through the assessment where they can actually pick, um, you know, whatever character they need. So whatever language, and I even believe it supports some random languages as well. So they have that feature on Kia. Awesome. And another question was, are there any options um, that allow multiple authors to build an assessment? Uh, I mean, basically, through Kia, no, Socrative, no, Discover Education, not that I'm familiar with, Google Forms, yes. Uh, everything on Google is collaborative. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so that's mainly if you, if you want students to build an assessment, which honestly might be the best option. Due to the fact that it's so limited on some of the features, so you can, you know, kids won't be so distracted by putting images and audio. They can really just focus on the questions instead. Good point. Um, of all of these, which has, uh, <coughs> oops, wrong question. Which of these, okay. if you had to suggest of those that you share, which one would be the best place to start? with the most capabilities? Would you suggest um, it be Kia? Yeah, if you're looking for, yeah, I, I've just been such a huge fan of them. And they've, they've really supported, like, just, just, and I honestly, contacting customer service, I've never had to do it until I asked for getting a free subscription for um, the webinar, essentially. They, it's so, it's user-friendly once you get the hang of it, and it's just so intuitive, and it's totally worth the price for me. Um, Key is great, and if you want a free option, I would go for Socrative. Those are my top two. Okay. And those are all the questions. Lori, did you find any additional questions? Okay. Yes, I did, Kim. Um, right. Let me go to my list. Going back to the beginning, um, what about elementary students who do not have email accounts? And I actually think somebody in the room answered that one, but I'll ask it anyway. OK, I, I believe you don't have to have a login for Discovery Education. Your kids do not have to have a login for Discovery Education. Um, and that's nice and Socrative as well. You don't need a login either. And I don't think they do for Kia either, right? Right, you can actually make it, like, when, when you guys took the final exam, you can make it so they don't have to log in, as long as you trust your kids enough to put in their real name. But essentially, the way that I combat that is, if you don't put in your name, then I won't know you take it, so you don't get credit for it. So they'll, they'll put in their name. That's true. That's a good point. They definitely want to get credit for it. Sure. How are students notified of their grades? 
Um, with Socrative, you have to notify them. Uh, and generally, you know, it, you can post it. I, using Haiku, for example, we have online. Every, I think a lot of people have abilities to check their grades online. Kia, um, they, they get the grades immediately. And that's mm. the beauty of it. They click a button and they get the grade. Um, Discover Education, I believe, works the same way. And excuse me, I'm coughing. Mm -hmm. I haven't picked you up audio for that one. And um, for Edmodo, they also get their grade automatically right there. But if, if that's only if you, you on Edmodo, you can select whether you want their, them to get their grades then or later. So, uh, and Kia also for longer questions, if you did an extra, uh, an essay question of, so, of some sort, uh, they can get their grades later. But with Kia, they can log on and see whenever the grade is posted. Uh, with Edmodo, um, it's a social feature, and they can just, you know, it, there isn't really a notification. You can ask for notifications, so uh, they can sign up via text message or through app. Um, there, there's an Edmodo app, and they can have push notifications through there as well uh, whenever their grade is updated. Great another point. one, another one I found was how do you utilize Google Forms when you are having students submit answers for upper level math problems without doing multiple choice? Yeah, um, Google Forms might not be your best bet. What I would recommend if you really want to use Google Forms for upper level math problems is what I was talking about earlier. You essentially create just one, if you really want to go paperless, you have a form that you've made. The students go to that form, put their name in, and either they can send a link to a document that they've made somehow, or perhaps there's a whiteboard app. Like, I would recommend Show Me. Um, that's an iPad app, and also it's a, um, you're able to access it and use it online as well, where they can, you know, write in their answers and whatnot, and you're able to look at it online. When it comes to math, uh, that's a difficult it's hard. dilemma. Yeah. Right, right, and especially when Google Forms. It gets really challenging. So when you need something that's longhand like that, that requires, um, you know, things that are not necessarily, you know, alphanumeric letters. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah, Google Forms might not be your best bet with that. I used to use something called Math Types, which is like a font, but you have to pay for it. That adds in um, to Word or whatever the uh, different math um, operations. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, honestly, a plain old Word document is probably your best bet. And there's, yeah. a, there's also a graphing feature. There was something that in our professional development just the other day, they were showing everybody something you could do regarding graphing on Microsoft Word. So mm -hmm. this might actually be, Enmodo might be your friend, where you, the kids can actually upload the assignment to Enmodo, and you can just grade it with comments and highlights right there. And, and do you have any other I questions? I have one more. One more, sure. Kim. Um, any tools you know of for assessing online with rubrics? Not that I'm familiar with. Um, like where you just push a button, and it, I, I guess that's what they're assuming, that you have an automated rubric online, you push a button, and it grades it for you right there. Um, I know that there's programs. There's desktop or laptop-based programs that will do that. There was one I used um, when I was in Gwinnett County, so that's where I worked for the big high school, um, that was meant for foreign language. It's called, it was a renaissance software was what it was called. And I was able to grade by clicking on different parts of the rubric and it would pop up with a score. I'm not familiar with a web-based one, um, but I will certainly look for one now because that's a brilliant idea. <laughs> and I'm sure it exists. And if not, you could probably make Google Forms do that for you. Mm -hmm. um, it would just work out where you would have a form and you would essentially have a rubric designed in the form by question and you would put in your scores for whatever part and it would calculate it on the spreadsheet for you. So that's probably your workaround for that. Okay. Those are all that I had that were different, Kim. Okay. I know with Rubistar that you can make the um, rubrics online mm -hmm. and then I don't uh, think but I don't know about scoring the results right right uh, like online automated I'm not sure either yeah um, that's why I think like when I think about it I actually think I'm going to pursue this 
a little more. Maybe do a video on it if I can make it work with the Google Forms. I like the idea a lot of entering a rubric design there where you as a teacher can go in and do the scores per student. And because you can do the form over and over and over again and just push it out to spreadsheet so long as your spreadsheet is set up with sums, for example, where it can, you know, sum whatever and divide and give you the score. So that's possible. It takes a little bit of work up front, but I think that might be the best bet for making a rubric that grades for you, essentially. Well, it says um, Rubistar, you can make your rubrics interactive, but I haven't used it in a while to see exactly what they mean yeah, by interactive other there. than giving feedback. Anyway, that's something that people can explore at a later time. The Ruby Star, I, um, I put the link in the, the chat. That's a great idea. <laughs> I know, Becky. I'm really, oh. I think I'm going to probably spend my weekend working on the Google Forms thing now. <laughs> and are there any other questions before we um, exit out today and let Kat and go and everybody enjoy their weekend. If there's something we missed, please let us know. Um, and uh, Kat, if you could uh, put your email in here. Um, you can also contact Kat by, uh, there you go, um, Twitter and there's a variety of ways you can connect and that information is in our Live Binder link and uh, as well as all the resources shared. And we post those on our website at live.classroom20.com. So all of those will be posted later. And the additional links that people shared um, will be posted to our website later on this weekend. And if I do find a solution, which I think I actually, I think I will this weekend, I will totally tweet about that in a second. So if you're, if you're right. following me on Twitter, I will follow people back from here. I love following people. So um, I'll keep everybody updated via Twitter. Great. So if you could check back on our archives link that Peggy posted, you'll be able to see the recording and the chat log. And then the Live Binders link will have the additional links added later today. So um, thank you so much, Kat, for joining us today. And thank you, everybody. Um, when, and we want to remind everybody if you could use the hashtag LiveClass20. When you're tweeting, that helps uh, filter, and uh, we can keep up with things and answer your questions if you send us a question, um, if you have the live class to zero, because um, we keep track of those in TweetDeck. And thank you so much, everybody. We hope that you'll join us uh, next week when we um, have our feature teacher session. So everybody have a wonderful week, and we will see you hopefully during the uh, Global Ed Conference next week, as well as online, and see you next Saturday. Thank you, everyone, for joining. Take care. Have a great weekend.